My name is Emily Fictor. I'm the co-chair along with Councillor Thibodeau, who I saw earlier, there he is, um, of the Reiki Building Level Advisory Committee. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. It is January 28th at 5.32 p.m. and we are meeting via Zoom. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead um, as people continue to join us and take um, attendance as we go. So I don't think we need to go through that process. Um, I see you and thank you again for being here. Um, but I did want to go over the minutes before I hand it over to Lisa and Mark to walk through the agenda for tonight. So um, have folks had an opportunity to see the minutes? And if so, are there any questions or changes to the minutes? They are the minutes uh, from our November 19th meeting. And does anyone need the link? Cause I could put that, I'll put that in the chat just in case. All right. Um, Emily, I think there should have been some from December there. No, yeah, I wondered that. This is what I saw on board docs. We did meet in December though, huh? Yeah. Um, the, that's what you sent me, Emily. That's what I uploaded. So I don't know if maybe you sent the wrong ones. Or Did I attach the wrong one? Whoops. All right. Let me look into it. But Emily, maybe. To me, I can update them. Um, okay, thanks. Maybe in the case we can come back to the minutes at the end of the meeting. Does that work? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, excellent. So, um, Mark and Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you to walk us through the agenda, and thank you so much. Very good. If uh, I can be granted permission to share my screen. One moment. Thank you, Ray. Very good. I think everyone can see that. I gotta rearrange my desktop here just so I can make sure I can see all of you. All right. And uh, just to, uh, moving to the agenda item, one was the um, item that we already partially completed. And so welcome everyone. I think actually, if, if we recall, I think the fourth uh, Thursday in December ran into the holidays and I don't know that we actually had a meeting. I think we sent an uh, update around to everyone. So November is likely the last set of minutes. And so as we get back to yeah. that, uh, we, can, <clears throat> we can sort of, um, uh, recover where we left off there. And Lisa and I haven't, haven't sort of choreographed in advance of this, who's doing what. So, uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep each other on our toes here and, uh, and update. So, uh, just very quickly, the agenda uh, items that we're going to cover tonight are the green new deal referendum question C update and lead update. Last, I think will be complete the issue of the Green New Deal, um, uh, but I think we haven't, haven't sort of come full circle with this group yet. So as our meeting last meeting was in November. So we'll give you an update on that as well as where we are with LEAD. Uh, we will give you an update on our staggered bid schedule uh, that uh, I think has finally settled down now in terms of where, where we are with, uh, with that aspect of it. And then We'll uh, give you an update on the owner's representative selection and the process for the selection of clerk of the works. We'll give you some design updates and then uh, a update on the, pre G the GC pre-qualification with the general contractor pre-qualification and finally next steps. So without further ado, uh, the Green New Deal, I think everyone, I, I'm not sure if everyone uh, saw this in the update that we sent, but uh, ultimately what 
what we now um, have come to uh, terms with with regard to the impact of the Green New Deal referendum question that was last October uh, was that um, there's there's sort of a couple pieces. One uh, big item was that in a, reviewing the language in the uh, in the city um, ordinance, the uh, <clears throat> the degree to which we uh, would be grandfathered, that is, under the old uh, or the existing requirements prior to the new ordinance taking effect, uh, we had to either um, be underway with the planning, with our applications to the planning board uh, for projects that require planning board approval, or we would have had to submit to the uh, planning inspections department for the building permit if if it wasn't something that required planning board approval. And so uh, the projects had, as we I think had talked about last time, had all been submitted to planning and we confirmed that. So that was um, one impact that um, meant that we could comply with the old green, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the green building code, which is part of the uh, city of Portland uh, ordinance. So, so that meant that the re new requirements from the uh, Green New Deal would not be in effect for the BFOF projects. The next piece was that uh, there's a definition for the renovation and what a renovation is. And so if you're undertaking a renovation of a certain size, uh, then, uh, then you have to comply with the Green Building Code. And in looking at the assessed value, you have to the construction cost has to uh, exceed the assessed value in order for you to um, have to go through the requirements of the Green Building Code. And uh, Reiki has uh, the updated assessed value, uh, as you can see on the bottom of this slide, uh, approaches the, or it's a, just over the $19 million uh, value. The construction uh, estimate is 15.75 million. So we, we don't meet the threshold of a renovation um, and therefore the requirements of the Green Building Code don't apply to Reiki. This was a similar condition that we had for Lyseth School where the value of the property for the Lyseth School uh, because it included Lyman Moore exceeded the uh, construction value. So um, that being said, we, we um, so we don't, we don't have the same um, requirements that Longfellow and Presumpscott will have with respect to uh, the Green Building Code. We are still pursuing lead uh, even in light of that. So we're still moving forward with a lot of sustainable initiatives that we're doing in the other projects as well. So that's, that's um, uh, kind of an update on the Green New Deal uh, and its app uh, applicability to Reiki. Any questions on that before? we move forward. So seeing none, uh, the next piece is the lead update and uh, I will turn to my colleague, uh, Lisa Sawin for an update on lead. Uh, Can everyone hear me okay? Good. Um, well, good evening. Good to see everyone. It's been a while. Um, so uh, we've been working closely with Thornton Thomas study um, to continue our dialogue on um, lead and our uh, silver threshold. Um, so we continue to track points, um, the way these spreadsheets are set up for anyone who's not familiar with lead. Um, we track yes, as in these are the ones that were on, on track for achieving the documents, the scope, um, are in alignment. Um, and those are called the yes um, ones. And those are the ones you see in green. Um, and then we have a couple maybe columns and we use kind of a strong maybe or a weak maybe um, and the no column as in the scope just won't align um, for that credit and is not achievable. And so this is kind of the analysis we do throughout the project. Um, the categories, um, there's different categories lead is broken down into um, and really just looking at uh, really a holistic approach to sustainability. Um, the good news, so the long and short of it, is we are tracking above the silver standard right now. 
And um, so we need to be in a 50 to 59 point threshold, um, or, you know, at least 50 and to 59 is the silver threshold. Um, we like to strive for 53 to 55, even though 50 is the minimum, um, just to have a little bit of a, a cushion. We never know how different lead interpreters will, um, our reviewers will interpret our approach. Um, but we're very confident in Thornton Thomas Study's experience going through this program um, and uh, reviewing the documents and the project to make sure that we do achieve those credits. Um, so want to just provide an update. We were just below 49. We had a couple um, changes in some of the, um, the credits. And so the surrounding density and diverse uses, um, uh, some language change in that credit, which allowed us to get um, some additional points. Um, and so we'll continue to look at some of the points in the strong maybe category um, so that we can strengthen up our point total um, so that we're confidently within the silver range um, when we go out to bid. So that was a, a quick update. Um, I'll pause there to see if anybody has any questions about um, LEED and the Reiki project. Lisa, do we, do we also want to mention the uh, engagement with the schools that we're um, going to move to uh, undertake. Uh, Thornton Thomas said he's interested in connecting with, with the uh, schools. Uh, Thank you. That's where I'm going with that. <laughs> you know, we're, usually, we're usually good at cues. I didn't pick that one up. Thank you, Mark. Um, so yeah, we will be reaching out to each of the principals at each of the schools. Um, Thornton Thomas said he, as well as Harriman, want to engage um, engage the leadership in a dialogue around the sustainable initiatives that we're taking in the design and talk about ways to create educational opportunities for the staff and students. Um, and so I'll be reaching out um, probably early next week to set up some potential dates to kind of talk through that and then uh, to speak with you guys about um, the broader audience that we can take that to. So that's an exciting initiative um, as well. Great. All right. Moving to uh, another topic that uh, we uh, built into the Lyseth project and as part of the initiatives that we uh, are putting forward with the BFOF construction projects, and that uh, deals with the fair wage contracting. And so what that uh, does is it ensures that the contractors that bid on the project will pay the workers a, um, a, a, a fair wage for their services. So um, because these are, are publicly bid projects and that it's a low bid, low qualified bid, um, there's always competitive pressures to try to come in with lowest prices. And what the fair wage contracting does is it provides a baseline that says you must meet this uh, minimum wage for the workers. And we use the State Department of Labor uh, as, as a sort of metric for that. They put out wage guidelines that are updated periodically and they're specific to a location in a particular building trade. And so that we include in the, in the contract documents and we also include a reporting um, requirement for the contractor to submit that what they're actually paying uh, on, on a monthly basis. And so that gets reviewed as part of the, the pay application from the contractor. So that's, um, that's important. It, it also, um, the contractor is required to post those uh, uh, wages on, somewhere on the site. It's usually around the construction trailer. Uh, and, um, and then again, we, we follow up with the contractors to, uh, if, if there are any irregularities or uh, concerns about whether they are paying that fair wage or not. So that's, that is a, not necessarily a requirement um, uh, of, of the um, uh, green uh, building code with respect to the new, uh, the, uh, new green, the Green New Deal, but it is something that we've carried forward. It was important um, in the, as we undertook the construction at Lyseth and it's gonna carry forward to these next three schools. Any questions on that? Okay. 
this is in, in uh, hopefully you can see this is just a copy of what it looks like. So, um, and uh, it, this was the actual, the actual one for lights out. So. An update on the staggered bid schedule. Uh, we talked last time about the fact that um, we might be uh, approaching this project with uh, by by staggering the start the when we put the contract out to bid for contractors to submit pricing on and um, and the uh, idea that uh, by doing that it allows us to take advantage of a single contractor pool um, that um, we'll talk about in a minute, but it allows us to take advantage of that contract pool to bid on potentially more than one project. And so the idea that if, if a contractor puts together pricing for this first project and they don't get it, they still have time to bid on the next project. And so we don't, if we were to try to do them all at once, we would, um, we would have contractors that might bid on uh, only one project or, um, because they, they couldn't take on more than one project uh, because of their size. So, uh, so they would probably select only one project to go at. This way, if they, they're not successful in getting one, they still have an opportunity. So it, it increases the bid pool for each of the school, schools that, uh, that are bidding. And the advantage that that has is that the more contractors we have, the, uh, the, the sort of end result is greater competition and lower pricing, higher value for your dollar. So that's that's kind of the primary strategy there, and what we have done is looked at uh, the order of these is such that for some Scott we elected to to move to the the last project, and that's because it has the greatest flexibility in its schedule. Um, for some Scott is is the fastest because it doesn't have to create um, a series of swing spaces and moving uh, moving students out of uh, places in the occupied school in order to undertake the renovation. They, the addition for, uh, for some scat happens pretty independent of the building itself. And there's not a lot of renovation inside the building. That's certainly not the case with Reiki. Um, Reiki, you've got <laughs> a lot of renovation. And, and so, um, so that that's the good news is that you're going to get a lot of uh, refreshed space. The, the other side of the coin is that you're going to be living with construction for a period of time. So that's, um, so Reiki and Longfellow were the, the two that um, we were going to uh, do first. And uh, in looking at um, logistically how, um, how the documents are prepared and, um, uh, and the construction value, uh, we went with Longfellow first and then Reiki next. So they, each of these staggers by about a month. So the first one goes to bid in at the end of February, the next one at the end of March, and, and then finally for some at the end of April. And the bid period itself is about four weeks that we give for contractors to price the project. Uh, and then um, and then we'll review the pricing and award the contract. And then after award, the contractors can uh, begin the process or, uh, to mobilize or get, get all their documents ready, get contracts signed with subcontractors, and then begin to, to get ready to mobilize for the start of the construction season, which uh, mostly coincides with the end of the school year. So, um, so the idea that even though we're staggering the bids, um, the intent is that they'll all begin construction at roughly the same time. And so this again is a little bit of uh, what we just covered, but the idea of why we're doing the staggered bid has to do with the fact that um, we, in talking with uh, several contractors, um, that there's a, a limited pool um, uh, to manage multiple projects. And so um, most contracts don't have three project managers and three superintendents to commit to doing uh, all three projects. And so there are only a few contractors in the state that, that have that capacity that if we were to try to combine everything into a single project, that they could undertake the, the entire project. So that that was one that there's just not enough contractors out there to, to have a competitive pool to do all three projects at once. And by having a larger pool, as, as we talked about, you'll, you'll have lower construction costs. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the first um, rule. Uh, the first item is to, to really increase our, our bid pool. Uh, also 
at this time, there are two large projects that are going on uh, in the uh, in the construction world right now, and that that is the um, construction of the new uh, South Portland Middle School, and that's a, a pretty good size one. It's somewhere around in the sixty million dollar uh, construction cost range, and then there's an Auburn uh, High School that is about a hundred million dollars. So that that consumes the large contractors that can handle that. So they likely would would go after those before a complex renovation of uh, 30 months in three separate locations. And so, so there's the idea is that we, we're trying to, to attract uh, contractors that can do smaller projects instead of the contractors that can do the larger ones. Cause we, we, again, we think that they're going to be busy with additional work, uh, larger projects that are out there that may be more attractive to them. Uh, and, and the last is we, we had some experience doing exactly this on a similar uh, type of uh, work in the Yarmouth School District where uh, we had four different schools, but we bundled them into three different projects and staggered their bids. And um, and so just to give you an idea of, of how many contractors bid on each of them and what the results were, um, the first one was uh, was there were five five bidders um, and the construction value was about $5 million. So that... Uh, and it came in slightly under budget, about $360,000 under budget. The second one uh, was um, just a, a little bit larger. It was about $10 million project. It had seven bids, and it came in about 600000 under budget. And again, the, those contractors that bid on the projects were all from the same bid pool, so similarly what, what we're dealing with. And, and again, we'll explain that in a minute. The last one... Uh, was the larger of them, and it was about t- about a thirty million dollar project, and it only received three bids, and it came in uh, a, a little over uh, budget, or about two point eight million dollars over budget, and so um, so that um, that again shows a couple things. One, the larger projects tend to get less bidders on them, uh, and um, and then the smaller bid pool typically is a less competitive pricing when we uh, open the bids. So that's, that's that. But the overall, um, the process of splitting up the projects into multiple bids uh, was more successful than we think it would have otherwise have been had we tried to do everything at once. So as we also kind of explained at the beginning that Presumpscot has the shortest schedule and the least amount of interior renovations. And so that's why we put that one last. And then Reiki is almost all all interiors, and it has um, uh, the largest construction value, and um, and so it doesn't require as much uh, work to um, uh, to get in the ground and, and get the uh, exterior additions going, and um, and so that therefore it had a little a uh, little more flexibility than Longfellow, which has a, a, the uh, a slightly larger uh, exterior work uh, that has to happen with that one. So that one. Uh, we're trying to give, give a little more time for the projects that have more work on the addition side of it than uh, than on interior renovations. Next, uh, the owner's rep. Um, and so this we typically pick on uh, Mr. Stephen Stilfen to, to update everyone with uh, the discussion of hiring an owner's representative to assist the district in uh, carrying out the responsibilities of overseeing uh, these construction projects. So, Steve, I don't know if uh, you want to say a few words here. Yeah, I'll just follow up with that CHA was selected through a uh, RFQ uh, request for qualification process where we had for applicants and um, currently I'm negotiating with them to provide the areas of uh, need that do not overlap with the clerk of the works position. So we'll have a traditional setup for construction project management moving forward with the three schools, owners rep reporting to the architect um, and owners, uh, excuse me, clerk of the works to the architect and owners rep representing and working with us to provide project management in the areas of uh, where we are responsible as the owner. For example, if we hold a contract to have the modulars put in place, um, that's a 
Portland Public Schools contract, um, and also in the areas of looking over and assisting with administration of uh, fair wages, uh, requests for uh, information, change orders, uh, budgetary review, um, scheduling review, milestone markers. And um, so just to put together a very well-coordinated effort with three construction projects running at the same time. So uh, I'll be meeting with them tomorrow and we're getting close to hammering down the scope and the, and the numbers for the proposal. So I'm encouraged to wait at this point where we're at. So in the next few weeks or a week or so, we should have a, an agreement for Harvey here to uh, put a signature on. Thank you, Steve. Next, we'll, uh, Lisa is going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, thoughts we've started to explore for the interior. We've been focusing a lot on some of the uh, what the exteriors of the schools are going to look like, but uh, we've now started to dig into some of the details. And so with that. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you, Steve, for the explanation on the owner's rep. Um, <clears throat> we're excited to uh, welcome CHA to the team. So um, yeah, we've been having some, some fun, adding some life and color to the inside of the building, um, really uh, looking to um, reflect on the design statement that we worked with everybody in the community to create. Um, so for Reiki, we had uh, crafted a design statement that reads to create an inclusive environment that celebrates diversity, fosters collaboration, embraces nature and integrates into the urban fabric. And so um, what we've done is really look at, you know, the number one thing in the school that we've heard is we need walls, we need doors, we need classrooms that are separate acoustically. But at the same time, we want to be able to um, celebrate that connectedness of uh, Reiki community and provide those spaces where you can come together. So we still have the open center to the library um, with these great, um, uh, you can almost think of them as little buildings, if you would, um, kind of creating your own internal uh, urban fabric within the building. You have the different pullout spaces or small group learning areas. So where you see the numbers and the color, the red, the blue, the orange, the green, those are different um, small group learning areas where you can pull on a small group and do some small instruction or do different project areas. They also serve as great identifiers and wayfinding in the school. So the, the school is definitely gonna take on a little bit different landscape than what you're used to. You can't see everything all at once. The color and the numbers or graphics really help with the wayfinding through the building. Um, and we think it's a really fun and, and playful uh, interior for um, the age of the kids in the building. I'll pause there to see if there's any questions about um, the uh, direction that we're uh, um, starting to see in the interior of the building. I guess you'll, you'll also uh, notice a lack of waffle slab. Yeah. Unless that is really not the waffle slab. That's that's ACT ceiling. I know right. it's probably it still looks like a grid, but it is not the waffle slab, which is not as easy to cover up as one might think, given how low the ceilings are. Um, we have many meetings every week about how to coordinate everything that's above those ceilings to make sure we can keep as much floor to ceiling height as possible um, in those spaces. So. Um, definitely uh, is taking on taking on a life life of its own, and and we're uh, we're really excited to see um, uh, just the the life that you can see within the space already. I have a question: um, Is this considered the library space still? Yes. So um, it would seem that you. Pro it, where else will there be bookshelves? Oh, there. Uh, so. Right now, the bookshelves are just diagrammatic. Um, there will be many other bookshelves. These are just kind of put in there for a rendering so that you could understand that this would be the library space. Um, there will be um, adequate uh, uh, linear um, bookshelves for the number of books that uh, the, the library holds. So 
um, we'll be working very closely to dial in that count um, with the librarian in the space. And, and what height will the bookshelves be? I'm familiar with school libraries and um, my experience is it's important for them not to be, the bookshelves not to be above the children's heads. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a great, great point and great question. So what we do a lot, if it's, if it's on a wall, um, sometimes we'll take them a little bit higher because then you can store different things on the shelves up above or even be able to display books um, so that the, the cover is displayed for, um, for students to be able to, to see. Um, but a lot of them will keep down at uh, three feet and we'll actually put them on casters so that they're movable and very flexible within the space. Um, so they're not fixed within the library space and you have the opportunity to um, uh, set them up in different configurations. Great. And I have another question and this may not Absolutely. be quite the right time for it, but part of the, the mission was to embrace nature. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about how the overall design, maybe not what we're looking at right now, but the overall design uh, accomplishes that embracing mm -hmm. nature. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great question. Um, so we are playing with different design elements right now from a um, aesthetic standpoint, and we don't have the rendering done yet, and hopefully we can share it at the next meeting. But if we're in the same spot and we turn around to the other side, we're looking at different ways to um, uh, just kind of uh, acknowledge um, the idea of nature within the space through um, design. But um, as you, if you've been to Reiki and you're familiar with Reiki, you know that there's very limited connection to natural light. So we've tried uh, to um, maximize the natural light that you do have on that second floor and make sure nothing is blocking that and it can still flood this area with as much natural light um, and uh, be able to use um, uh, in, in as many ways to kind of connect back out to the natural landscape as we can. Um, we've met with the greening committee um, or the greening team um, at Reiki and are really looking to dial in the um, the selection of plant materials outside um, and how that ties into the curriculum at the school. So those are a couple ways right now that we've started to tie in um, uh, nature to the overall design. Thank you. I saw Councillor Thibodeau with his, uh, with his hand up, but um, Councillor, are you all set now? Yeah, as I was said, I was actually going to ask a similar question about how you light the space, and uh, and then Lisa answered it. So thanks for the follow-up. I'll just have a couple of quick follow-up points. Uh, one is that we, we actually think we're creating a little more additional wall space where where the three green, um, the, green the, the study room or the small group collaboration room, is we're actually uh, extending... Uh, a platform over the existing stairs, and so we're we're utilizing that space for circulation, so that we can we can f uh, fit in these uh, collaboration rooms. And so, in doing so, we're building building that wall behind the bookshelves, and so that actually gives us a little more uh, wall area to be able to put shelves against. Uh, where we're right now they're stairs. We're still going to keep the stairs in a number of locations because we think they they actually kind of provide these wonderful amphitheater type spaces, which which are also wonder wonderful to, to get a group of folks together or even uh, for students to be able to grab a book and, and uh, sit on and read. So those, um, and we're reducing the number of, of points of, of people moving back and forth through that space, but we're, we're extending, um, uh, like I said, the, we're taking, taking advantage of, of that area where the stairs are now and converting it to circulation space uh, to, to a little more efficient use of the area that you have in the building. And then kind of following up on what Lisa was saying, if you were to turn right uh, and, you, and we can't spin that way but one of the elements that lisa alluded to is is sort of how we're going to incorporate uh, nature and looking at natural materials right now there's not a lot of of uh, there's some wood in the building but but the idea of trying to incorporate natural materials such as wood in here um so that it's a it provides warmth and it also again resonates with the, the sort of a natural um, material or feeling uh, inside the building Great. So the next series of slides is, uh, is sort of a discussion about the entrance area. I know that's been a topic of conversation that um, uh, has come up a few times. And so 
we've been doing a little bit of, of kind of an overview of, of where we've come from with it and thought this would be uh, an opportunity for, for a discussion uh, on it. And so everyone, I think, can recognize that this is the, uh, what you see uh, today. Uh, well, not today. It's a little more snowy uh, covered uh, uh, recently, but but the idea that that's pretty much the form of the of the building and the uh, entrance post uh, the uh, removal of the ramp um, and and the entrance itself. It's it's absolutely fascinating uh, to to imagine what it was with the ramp um, uh, back in the day and and how it recognized an entrance to the school. But we'll we'll kind of hold that for a second. But so this. This again is is kind of a, a understanding of the uh, different uh, architectural components of the uh, of the building and its expression and its its engagement with the with the neighborhood and um, and so what what the takeaways of this are that there's a there's really three materials to the building which um, is not unlike many buildings of its period we have glass concrete and brick and so so that's really the expression and it's and it's a very um, uh, sort of, um, um, it doesn't have a lot of detail to it. We, we have, you know, the, the openings are, are broken up inside of the brick panels, uh, and you have the, the expression of the interior structure, the floor plates and the roof structure are really expressed all the way through the building. So you have those bands of horizontal bands of concrete, which, which really are, um, the interior, um, structure of, of the building. So that's, uh, that's where that is. And so, uh, this is what has been shared with uh, with the community in terms of thinking about the small addition that we're putting on the front. And then there's this whole somewhat controversial, I guess, um, trellis that, that was put onto the front of the building as well. And the, and the intent of the, of the trellis was, was in some ways to provide this um, uh, element that had some uh, form of, of whimsy that would allow plant material to potentially be trained up and around it. Uh, and also that that the sunlight would kind of move through it and and around it and create this transition from sidewalk to to building, uh, and it was it was rendered sort of um, material neutral. It wasn't there was no depiction of any materiality to it. It was simply just a, a, a clay, uh, almost a, just a gray gray form itself. And um, some of the comments we heard was that it, it doesn't relate to the building uh, and that its scale seems uh, somewhat out of place with the building itself. Uh, and um, and that it wasn't sort of um, uh, relatable to to the scale of of uh, the elementary students. And so, uh, so then um, we started thinking about okay, how did we get to this point? And, and and so we started looking at the neighborhood itself and what is it in the neighborhood that uh, makes this a unique space and area? And so um, a series of slides here is just going to point out some of the things. So the big thing that that I think a theme that we carried or that we um, started to, to discern from uh, thinking about the neighborhood is the fact that, that there is this transition from sidewalk to entrance. Uh, and that's evident in just about all of these buildings. And, and what's wonderful is sort of these the pre-modern um, buildings, uh, you certainly had, had different scaling elements, but you also had this transition uh, and these porch-like elements at, at mark the entrance. So there's a very strong hierarchy to the entrance element uh, and, uh, and an articulation in lots of different ways of what that uh, that entrance element is, and in almost all of them, uh, it's it's kind of what sometimes we refer to as trabeated, that it, it's sort of built from a kind of a post and lintel uh, expression. So you have columns and you and you have you know beams that run across it, and and, and sometimes those are expressed with a lot of di different Victorian character to them. And so there's there's lots of different styles, brackets and dentals and and the like, and architraves, but. Um, but the, the, the sort of uh, takeaway uh, from this is that there's this, uh, there's this relationship between the sidewalk uh, and then, then there's a uh, component of um, uh, an area just uh, to, the, to the side of the sidewalk, which sometimes is with larger granite uh, curbs and fences. And then there's a porch-like element uh, that expresses the entrance itself. Uh, and again, you see that expression in, in lots of different ways. Um, uh, here's an example with what uses columns uh, and then also uh, a uh, fluted pilaster um, to separate the, the different element, the one on the right. Um, and then the one on the left has a more um, uh, fanciful uh, transition that was added on in, in, the, uh, in the past uh, or since, since certainly the building was constructed. But, 
but um, that's a relate that transition in, in relationship from uh, from sidewalk to to the entrance itself. Uh, this one's got shifted down a little bit, but this one really is a porch, um, and so it has a whole um, uh, canopy and and occupiable space between the sidewalk and the building itself. Uh, this one uh, is again an, an idea that that you have a scaled down enclosed uh, entry area between sidewalk uh, and entrance itself, uh, creating kind of a porch and, and using brick piers uh, to, to define it that integrate into the building itself. And of course, um, there's the uh, work that was done when the removal uh, on, on the backside or what we call sometimes the backside of the building was done and um, in the new entrance to the community center. And this, this entrance uh, it defines um, uh, the relationship with their exist the existing predominantly through this, this element uh, that where the name Reiki Community Center is where, where you can see that it comes into and engages with uh, the band uh, at, um, at that floor line uh, and beyond that, it has a little bit of a, an overhang with the glass pair of doors and transparency. Transparency oftentimes, again, is, is a hallmark of an entrance. It, it sort of invites you into it. Um, and, um, but but not, not much beyond that in terms of its relationship to the existing building. Certainly, the, there's an intentionality to use a different material to distinguish it from the existing building. And that, that oftentimes is is the case that we don't try to replicate in the same material that we we understand that that uh, buildings undergo a series of uh, iterative um, ed evolutionary uh, uh, growth and so this is one aspect of the growth of this building or the change of this building um, and here here is one digging up from the archives um, uh, just for amazingly it's only I guess been about four years um, and I love I love the sign to the right that says school entrance, a little arrow um, that that you kind of go underneath the ramp to get access to it. Um, just um, really interesting to, to see that from the Brackett Street side. And so thank you for Councillor Thibodeau's effort in getting that removed. So um, we uh, which it's far more inviting today. So one thing that we considered is is really thinking about this. We think we have kind of two approaches. One is do, do we look at the modification of, of what we wanted almost to become a sculpture that was um, this, this uh, element at the front of the building that really is playful and whimsical and, and kind of marks the spirit of, of um, youth and, um, and becomes you know an, not part of the building itself, but a, a mediator between the environment uh, and the building and in some ways Again, as, as I said, it's, it's a sculptural um, uh, uh, intervention into the landscape uh, that, that our thinking, again, was that, that in talking to the Greening Committee could have, could have plantings uh, uh, in, in integrated with it, so training up of it. And so you can, you can kind of see what it would be like from all three different vantages. But we're, we're, not, we're not necessarily wed to this. And I think, I think um, the, the next slide is sort of, if what would it be like without that element? Uh, and this is this is again, if we paired back uh, that and took that off, what does the entrance look like? And this this is the what we started with before, but I don't think anyone actually saw this. Um, I think we've always shown it with this uh, trellis in in front of the building. And so this is is what it looks like um, if if we just uh, left that out. Um, and uh, and what we've tried to do is relate to in very in some similar ways that the um, uh, community center entrance did. We we're trying to relate to to the existing um, architecture, and so you can see where we've we've taken that horizontal band and we built it into the canopy uh, at the entrance itself, and pulled that canopy out to engage with um, with the sidewalk. And so that's that's sort of a similar this this uh, intermediate step between sidewalk and the neighborhood fabric and the building itself. We have, we have this porch-like element. Again, this one's somewhat similar to some of the examples we've seen where we have a, a, a post or a column, uh, and, then, and then we sort of have the, the overhanging porch element. This is paired back so that it's a little more in keeping with the modern building uh, that Reiki is. Uh, and then the addition is 
and again, similar to what we'd seen with, with the community center entrance, the volume and material expression of that, um, well, we haven't identified it as much in this, uh, this is more of a massing study, but in the original expression, you saw us look at what we might use and that, that would be some type of a, a panel system that's, that's different, that's complementary to the, to the material in the building, but is distinctly different from, uh, from the base building itself. And so, so again, this is as, as you were to come up, a lot of transparency at the entrance itself, transparency from the administration uh, window. So that, that glass that we see just to the left of the entrance doors is the admin area where they can see uh, folks coming into the entrance um, and uh, have that, that sense of security and understanding who's coming and going to the building. Uh, distinctly different from what you have today. Uh, again, this is just from, from the other side. And so, so these are just quick massing studies, but we, we actually, in looking at this, felt, felt very comfortable if that trellis element weren't there, um, that we would be okay with, uh, with looking at that too. And so, um, and so we, we, leave, we leave it there to open it up for any thoughts or conversations on that particular aspect of the entrance. Thank you so much. Um, what feedback do committee members have? You can use your raise your hand function feature at the bottom of the Zoom window if possible, so I can make sure to see you since the presentation is on this is on my screen as well. Um, all right, uh, Superintendent, and then uh, Councillor Tibeto. Just. Um, maybe uh, some insights into the cost, um, the cost implications of one versus the other. Cer certainly the cost of having that um, trellis element there um, is, is more expensive than not having it there. Uh, and at least I don't, I don't know if we'd have to go back. I did not dig up the cost from the cost estimate on what that element is, but we'd have to, to, uh, to dig that up. So I don't, I don't want to, um, put a number out there that's not accurate. Uh, so we can look into that, but certainly it's, it's definitely more expensive to have, have that element, which is really kind of a freestanding uh, piece. And, and it doesn't, it doesn't the need to be there for the rest of the design as, as you're viewing it here to even be, be uh, constructed. It's really independent. Councilor Thibodeau, did you have something? I literally had that exact same question. So <laughs> two for two. You guys are good. You guys are on it tonight. All right, Francesca. Hi. Um, I'm just, I didn't consider the finances, but I'm just looking at the aesthetics. This one without the trellis just seems very, I understand it's a mass study, but it's very blocky. It doesn't, it doesn't feel welcoming. And I remember that one of the key words that I heard in the former discussions was some element of whimsy was needed to um, make it more child oriented and, you know, just visually accessible. So, you know, maybe there's a third, maybe there's a, a, a third angle here that's cheaper than, <clears throat> your trellis, your colorful trellis idea. But um, I certainly am prone to that. And I think one last thing, the comment you made about how to, how the neighborhood approaches doors and entries and places off sidewalks. I, I don't know, but I wonder if there's a way, and you mentioned the word Victorian. I don't, the, the, the trellis one is very contemporary and, and appealing and, and seems to complement the building well. But I'm wondering if there's a way instead that you could incorporate more of a, an, a response to the neighborhood architecture. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Francesca. Those are, those are some really good comments. Um, absolutely, thank you. Chris Moore. You know, uh, from an aesthetic point of view, I, and I guess this just could be um, subjective, but I sort of like it without the trellis. Um, I think it looks a little cleaner, a little more inviting, and the trellis to me looked um, sort of a little out of place in that front entryway. 
And what I really like when I look looking at this right now are sort of the smaller landscape features at the entrance, uh, which the entrance doesn't have right now. There's nowhere for kids or parents or anybody to sit uh, at the entranceway. And I think, uh, you know, sort of a way of maybe building whimsy is to have smaller features like that, that do speak to me sort of like on the West End, a lot of the architecture is stoops and a lot of places for people to sit in front of their house. And uh, those are the things that really sort of spoke to me in that picture. Um, and, you know, I'm not necessarily against any sort of trellis of sort, but it, I think I, I really do like the way it looks right now. And I thought the trellis felt sort of like a little bit of an add on and not necessarily cohesive with the rest of the building. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, Matt Peters. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate the scale and the tie into the band around the building with this um, with this iteration in front of us. Uh, but the the height and um, size felt very imposing. I do think there's an opportunity to bring whimsy with what you do with that column, since it is just supporting that roof. Um, that roof piece so that it probably doesn't need to be super chunky and blocky and is there a way to uh, maybe even lighten up that that roof roof component um, into the entryway not that that's a good trellis spot because you want to keep it dry obviously but um, I've seen some really interesting things with clear panels or something so you can feel the rain uh, fall above you when you're when you're in shelter and then I, I I really did appreciate what you're trying to do with the light with the trellis. I think I've seen some really fun uh, ways as how that you can track the sun and how it moves through the day. And so there might be a way to do something with that. I don't know if it's just on the very outer edge, but there's also a, you know, a simplicity, I think as well. So thanks. Thanks so much, Pat. Jeremy? Yes, uh, thank you. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I quite like the trellis. Could we could we look at the trellis again? Is it possible? Um, but I, I don't mind the trellis. I don't know if that is exactly the design. Like, if there's not a better design, you know, so something you guys can reach that gets there um, and it just matches for everyone. And I kind of feel that about the simpler masses of the of just having the over the you know canopy or whatever it was i think that that um i think either one could work i just think that you have to get the right design look that says, checks all the boxes for everyone and not everyone's always ever going to agree but you know whatever uh gets the most approval or looks right but i, I don't think that either one is necessarily off the table in my from, from my perspective um i'm not sure that given the busyness of the situation here and i'm sort of looking at this one now and the other one i feel the same way whether it's the canopy or this extended trellis i'm not certain that the the, the added complexity of of there's going to be some asymmetry in this space no matter what because you have the the you know the mass of the main building on the left the joiner the, the you know the part that joins and then the community center so these are they're not the same shapes and sizes so there's going to be asymmetry there but i'm not sure that accentuating and adding more asymmetry if that's not too busy and is part of the problem um because all the things that you showed were very symmetrical uh those entrances and very heavily and neatly framed. They looked solid and well supported, and as and they weren't flying in the way that this is. So I think that that might be one thing to think about. Um, but also, um, I think the trellis idea is you know the different. You could you could play with the scale and you could play with the layout, and there's ways to make it look um, less imposing, less threatening through design. And I'm sure you guys have lots of tricks up your sleeves that you can work with. Um, and I quite like the idea of could it reflect more of what the neighborhood is doing? I don't know exactly how you do that, but it would be a really neat feat if you were able to have sort of maybe almost the front of it start out as being more like something you would see in the neighborhood and then it moves towards a Reiki style uh, going back towards that 70s style. But I think it seems overly complicated and almost maybe impossible. Um, but yeah, so those are, those are my comments. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Um, Lauren, and just flagging that it's, um, we just have about four minutes and then have to wrap up because we have a, the Presumpscot um, meeting as well. So um, maybe we can figure out a way to follow up on, on this aspect um, after Lauren's comments offline. 
Lauren, are you there? Yep. Yep. Thank you, Emily. Um, yeah, I'll be quick. Um, I I agree with Jeremy and Chris and Matthew. Um, I I do. I do actually prefer the option that doesn't have the trellis. I think it's more successful. Um, maybe there's a way to even push that roof out to engage um, the community, um, to engage the students more in the entrance. But just another thing I want to speak about is um, there are some existing trees that would be great to maintain. And that pathway as it is right now goes right through where those trees are. So I think that's just something different to consider. So I know you have to wrap up so I can follow up after the meeting. Excellent. Well, uh, before Emily, I guess you, you wrap things up. I just want to say thank you. This is exactly what we wanted to do is provoke some dialogue and discussion as we uh, sort of uh, get regrounded in a potential option moving forward. And it's great that we have this committee to help provide that feedback. You folks that are very familiar with the, with the building in the neighborhood. So thank you very, very much. Mark, do you want to say just a couple words on the pre-qualification? Yeah, I'll do it very, very quickly. Yep, thank you. Uh, speed speed uh, information here. Let me. Um, so we received pre-qualifications from 10 contractors. This is the list of contractors that we received pre-qualification uh, applications from. Uh, we've evaluated them uh, and uh, we've looked carefully at uh, their, their applications and the information they provided. Uh, and I think we had recommended uh, to the school district that we uh, that we move forward with um, with the list, but that again is um, uh, I think the the sort of where we're at at this point in time. We were actually pretty excited to get get ten uh, contractors pre qualified for it. So we'll we'll uh, look to see uh, how that plays forward with the bidding uh, on the various projects. They there was not necessarily any clear indication that uh, the contractors were uh, how many projects they were interested in bidding, but um, but that was, um, that was, again, very, very good that we got this level of response. Terrific, thank you so much. And um, our next meeting is uh, February 25th. I believe we're holding these meetings now at 5.30, is that correct? So yes. We'll yeah, 5.30, 6.30, we'll rotate between Longfellow, I'm sorry, between um, Reiki and Presumpscott. So you guys will be 6.30, um, Presumpscott will be 5.30. We're gonna have Longfellow be the last one um, to accommodate the chair of that, of that committee. Okay, so terrific. So if everyone can note that our next meeting is at 6.30 on uh, February 25th. And um, just very quickly, does anyone have any comments or changes on the, um, the meeting minutes from our November 19th meeting? Can I just see with a show of hands if um, if you approve the minutes and then we can get that done and close the meeting. So I'll do approve the minutes. You can just actually show your, your actual hand. All right, looks like the minutes are unanimously approved. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone, sorry for the rushed end, but I, I really appreciate the time we spent on looking at the design um, elements. And thank you so much to Mark and Lisa and Emily. Um, uh, the interior for me is just so exciting. Um, and I know um, a lot of folks um, share, share that reaction. So um, see everyone on the 25th and thank you so much um, to our Harriman team for all this great work. Good night, everyone. Night. Good night.